Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Tana Mojo exposing people and Gabby Hanna trying to fight her and rice gum in a boxing match. And for you also going off on Ryland. But before we get into it, let me remind you to subscribe to this channel, turn on your post notifications, and also make sure to give this video a thumbs up. All right, let's get into it. Let's start off with a favorite on this channel, Trisha Paytas. We haven't really mentioned them like we used to. I feel like since Frenemies, Trisha got a lot of redemption and a majority of people like them a lot right now. So in the latest episode of Frenemies, Trisha went off, and I mean really off, on Ryland Adams, Shane Dawson's boyfriend. That like, oh, he was pissed at his viewers because his viewers were like, oh, thank you, finally, an hour-long video. But the way he said it was like, oh, everyone's saying, thank you, finally, an hour-long podcast. Like, he was, like, mocking them. I and everyone's like, that. they're like, why don't you just be grateful people are watching, which is kind of true. That's what said. She's like, uh, isn't it nice that people want more content? Yeah, but he's like, no, it's it's the way they said it. She goes, no, you're putting aggression in the tone. I don't know what it is. And I'm biased. I'm biased 100%. Rylan is a snake, snake, snake. When he said that shit, he didn't know about me and Jeffree Star, I was like, you are such oh. a you think you're snake. biased against so I'm, I'm a bias but i was so pissed and i you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna just say it. i'm a little petty i like to you know i as i do with some podcasts i like to hate watch or whatever because i'm like oh my god but watching that made my blood boil because the way he was like mocking that if you guys saw my last video we talked about ryland and his reaction to quote unquote aggressive comments wanting the podcast to be longer and honestly i think we can all agree with trisha how ungrateful ryland looked talking about the comments so here's what trisha's reaction was Trisha went on to say that they see Ryland as the devil, that Ryland is a snake and a liar, and that Lizzie should have her own podcast or maybe join Frenemies. By the way, is it just me or is it hard to focus on what Trisha is saying with that outfit and hair? Anyways, Ethan asked Trisha if they knew anything on Shane's comeback before they cut ties. Is Shane coming back? What's the deal with that? You have insider info. I'm you? me? No, I don't. I because I feel like I can't look at them. I can't look at them. Like it makes me literally. Wait, like, hold on. I remember it. once on this podcast when you're still friends with Shane. You you were like, he's about to make a comeback, and then you stopped yourself. I think he was. Yeah, I think he. I mean, he might. I don't know. I just, I can't. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Oh, he he oh, was wow. supposed to a month, you know, a while ago. I don't know. If you remember, a few weeks before their big drama, Trisha mentioned something about Shane planning to come back to YouTube, and then they stopped themselves, realizing they might spill Shane's plans. And Trisha answered Ethan that Shane had something in the works, but since everything that happened in the beginning of the year, they don't have any inside information. The, oh, I just can't stand him. His little smugness, like everything about, and he's just a liar. He's the snake in the grass. The one that I've always said that sold his soul to the devil, Rylan Adams, for sure. Is, but, wait, is Shane the devil? I, I would say no. They both sold their soul to the devil. You're only known for being engaged to Shane, and you're going to complain that people leave comments saying thank you for a longer video. Like they're thanking you, and you took it as a mocking tone. All right, here I we would go. live it. So comments, bro. There's no tone in hey, comments. Hey, dude, you should see what we say about you. <laughs> if that makes you angry, don't watch this. Oh, my God. Oh, what? <laughs> Oh, it made me so angry. And the way he did that tone, like, oh, finally a podcast. Be lucky you break 100,000 views. Like, it's insane to me that he thinks that, like, he's putting tone to comments that are being nice. Holy sh. And speaking of Ryland, he responded to the backlash he got last week on his reaction to aggressive comments. Here is the clip from the newest episode of The Sip. Every time I address comments, I come across as a baby. I get it. <laughs> I feel like even that addressing right there is going to have you come across as a baby. <laughs> I'm gonna make a little clown, baby. Well, no, but I've just, I have been seeing a lot of people being like, Ryland's different on the podcast. And I would like to say people are multifaceted, you know? I, yeah. And the podcast is definitely more performative than any of my other outlets because we're trying to entertain people yeah. through conversation. And we're blacked out. And you're caffeine. seeing two people's relationship that is one of like best friend type that like to get riled up about yeah. nothing. You know what I mean? He mentioned that people called him a baby when it comes to criticism, which is true. Ryland, please don't deny it. Remember when he turned off the comments on the episodes because he didn't want to handle the Trisha situation? Not sensitive towards criticism at all. Ryland went on to say that there is a difference when he's on camera and his in real life personality due to trying to be entertaining. He mentioned that in regards to his on and off camera relationship with Lizzie, since they're longtime best friends, but people have been talking about him being rude towards her on the last few episodes. 
you know, constantly interrupting her, not letting her speak for a long time, and so on. He added that him and Lizzie tend to fight and argue over nothing a lot of the time, which honestly does make sense. I'm like that with some of my closest friends. Am I wrong about that? <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying like you and I could fight about just, literally nothing. Like we could fight about the weather if we wanted well, to. Well, we're about to fight about the fact that you wouldn't have my back in a knife fight. I just don't think violence is the answer. I mean, I was just saying more so the fact like you and I particularly like to fight about absolutely nothing. Yeah, I guess. And I don't know why that gets us going. <laughs> I think it tickles us inside because we're not like actually confrontational people. Next, we're going to talk about another favorite, Gabby Hanna. Not trying to put her in every video, but I swear every time she's done something new, we've got to mention it. So this time it's nothing problematic at least. It's about Tana Mojo. She tweeted, how many million dollars do you think is worth me boxing for? Okay, go. Gabby replies to Tana saying, my management just hit me up about my boxing rates. Wanna go? I think enough people would love to see either and both of us nogged in the face. She also wanted to fight rice gum. Anybody got a 2016 flashback? She says, if rice gum breaks my nose in a boxing match, I can finally get the nose job he's been saying I need. Keemstar tweeted, rice gum the relevant versus Gabby the monster Hannah, Madison Square Garden. Gabby Hannah says, I asked for this match in 2018, let's go. And more on Gabby, her like to dislike ratio on her cover of You Oughta Know has more dislikes than likes. In my last video, we talked about people being disappointed in Gabby since it seems like she did everything in the past month or so only to promote herself. Not that we didn't see it coming, but still, people are really upset, especially people who also have ADHD since Gabby has been talking about her ADHD and majority of the responses have been negative towards her mental health issues as an excuse for bad behavior. And now we can clearly see how people feel about her. There are 11,000 likes and 19,000 dislikes on the video. You guys, almost two times the amount of dislikes. And lastly, on Gabby, she commented on Bo Burnham shading her. She tweeted, finally got a chance to watch Bo Burnham's new self-produced shot edited special last night. It was a beautiful juxtaposition of growth and stagnancy. He showed us a vulnerability and rawness he's only hinted at before. I'm grateful to consume art in a world riddled with content. Also, while I am 100,000% sure I wasn't anywhere close to Bo Burnham's mind while he was alone in a room for over a year creating a special intent entirely on his own, I do like to imagine. Alas, I am but a mere white woman on Instagram. And now for what just came out on Gabby, a new BuzzFeed article was released titled, Why is everyone so mad at Gabby Hanna? The article is written by reporter Scotchy Cole, who wrote the article from her own perspective visiting Gabby Hanna's home and interviewing her. She talks about how Gabby reached the height of her fame around 2016, 2018, and suddenly everything went downhill for her. She said, but these days, Hannah's YouTube page is largely dormant. Her subscribers are down to around 5.7 million, in the last month alone, she's lost 30,000 subscribers. In the last five months, she's posted only one video, a cover of Alanis Morissette's You Oughta Know. She associates Gabby's recent downfall to her recent controversies. She mentioned her 2017 story time about her classmate who died of a drug overdose, her 2018 scandal when she promoted those terrible makeup brushes, her 2019 beef with Trisha Paytas, and most seriously, her association with Curtis Lepore, Jesse Smiles' alleged rapist. Gabby said, who didn't I apologize to? I gave Jesse Smiles an apology, I gave Beyonce an apology, it feels like I'm always dishing out apologies and I've never once received one and that feels to me a little chaotic. The article mentions how all major social media personalities have been involved in numerous scandals such as James Charles, Tana Mojo, Logan Paul, Tati, I could just keep going on forever, but they've always been able to bounce back eventually, but this has not been the case for Gabby. So why should Gabby Hanna be treated any differently, the article says. Gabby says, I started on YouTube being a dramatic, loudmouth, confrontational storyteller, and that was the version of me everybody loved. At some point, I started hiding in myself and being silenced because I was so afraid of what people would say. I didn't have anyone backing me, I just wanted to be my f***ing self. Gabby does take some accountability, but of course she has to bring up the ADHD. The article says, Hannah admits that she hasn't been on her best behavior in the past. She says, of course I was a f***ing asshole. I have a f***ing neurological disorder that was unchecked and I wasn't taking care of my mental health. She says she's recently gotten a diagnosis for ADHD and CPTSD or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. She says, people throw it around a lot and say, oh, I'm ADHD when you're getting a little bit restless or fidgety, but it's a lot more than that. 
She said, adding that the disorder causes her to be impulsive and affects her short-term memory. Despite considering herself neurodivergent, she was called out for being an ableist in a March tweet dismissing tone indicators. Gabby went on to say, part of being neurodivergent is being impulsive and not fully thinking through decisions. I think people have a hard time differentiating between making an excuse and trying to explain yourself. And even in regards to her terrible response to the makeup brush backlash she received a couple years back, she takes some accountability, but ultimately ultimately blames it on others. That was a really bad response, she said about her response to the makeup brush fiasco. Part of the problem was not having a good team at the time and not having a ton of life experience. I went from being a drunk college kid to having a lot of followers and a lot of responsibility. And I was so defensive because I was already getting made fun of because I was a meme. When you get a lot of hate, it's hard to sift out what's hate and what's valid. I needed to learn a lot. Then they move on to talk about the Curtis Lepore situation. Hannah denied that she was ever Lepore's friend. She said that she had always believed what Smiles had said about her ex-boyfriend. She said, you have to really try to not give a f about what people say if it's not true. Every time I put out a project, it's instantly completely shut down by people starting a new rumor that day. Am I going to live like that forever or am I going to do whatever the f I want because you're going to hate me anyway? The author said, I don't know the truth about Hannah and Lepore, but I do know she has consistently handled criticism poorly. Unlike other YouTubers who behave much, much, much more poorly, Hannah actually replies to her detractors' comments, and when she does, it's so easy to assume she's hungry for the engagement. After all, she ultimately benefits from it. But what's frustrating is that she's trying to have it both ways, to relish in being the most hated person online, like Logan or Jake, while also being sensitive about it, like David Dobrik, who has not returned online since his apology video in March. In regards to Gabby's handling of the criticism she received about her poetry, specifically um, from Rachel O. Oats. She wrote, when I asked Gabby about how she chose to handle the dandelion review, she says she's fine with criticism, she just wants it to be constructive. Gabby says, but if you're going to continue to harass me and publish a book mocking me, whatever, me too, I can play the game. I'm not going after a poetry critic. There are people who have given my books negative reviews on Goodreads, but she's not a critic. She's calling me some on the internet and having her dog write a poem. The reporter says, I wasn't able to find a source for Oates calling her a bitch, but Hannah did call her one in an Instagram story in April, which I also asked her about. Gabby says she is a bitch, she said before laughing and turning to her publicist. Should I not have said that? Oates declined a request for an interview, but she provided a brief statement that said in part, Gabby's behavior towards me and others is shocking and upsetting, but my work speaks for itself and anyone who watches my videos or even reads my book, which parodies her writing style in places. We'll see her claims are unsubstantiated. I have never harassed her. I have never called her names. I have never mocked the subject matter of her books. I have only critiqued the writing style and apparent laziness of her work. Then Gabby says, I might as well do whatever the fuck I want because guess what? The views are up. You're going to listen to the fucking album because it's about the shit that you guys want to hear about. You're going to watch my series. You're going to read my book. You're going to fucking obsess over every movie that I do. You're going to fucking pay me for my Patreon to see my private content. I finally feel like I'm in control. It's a lot easier to cope with people hating you when you're fanning in the flames. Then she talks about all the money she's lost as a result of her beef with others, which is a direct contradiction to what she has been saying all along. She says, imagine you had a friend six years ago who to this day is contacting your employers, contacting everyone you know, and trying to ruin your reputation. Specifically, I think referring in part to Trisha Paytas. I lost sponsors, I lost a record deal, I lost my friends. Hannah estimates that between 2019 and 2020, she lost between five million and $10 million in revenue between AdSense books, sponsorship deals, and a record label contract with a company she declined to name. Does she actually make anywhere near that amount in a year for her to even be losing that amount? I don't know, man. Then she talks about how she's probably never ever going to return to YouTube full time. She wants to focus on music. At some point she says now she's focusing on offline pursuits. She wants to move to Hawaii and start a company that sells candles and cards. For now, her priority is making music. Uh, she's finishing her second album. She also says, I don't think I'm going to be an artist forever. I'm tired. She talks about how it's really scary to have the uncertainty of income when it comes to being an artist. She says, I have this fear that, okay, if I spend this much money here, or if I make the wrong move, I'll lose everything and I'll have to sell my house and maybe I'll be homeless again. All these irrational fears, but even if music didn't work out the way YouTube didn't work out the way I was hoping to, it'll be fine. I'll figure it out. I'll always be okay. That's my newfound freedom. Like me or don't. So that's pretty much it for the article. Let me know what you think about it in the comments.
Moving on, Tana Mojo, she's been going after a lot of people lately. She posted this tech talk with Gage, the boy that James Charles took to Coachella and then called him a clout chaser. And that tech talk was clearly shading James. Tana even liked a few comments on it that were mentioning him. As you know, he is in quite the scandal right now. He's been off of social media, well, partly. He posted on his birthday a selfie on Instagram, but other than that, he has tried to stay real quiet. We still don't know what's happening on the legal side of things with him. He's currently in a lawsuit that we already covered, and we haven't had any updates on his alleged victims pursuing legal action, so who knows? Here's Tana's TikTok. Lately, Tana has been talking more about people she's worked with, mainly the men in the industry, Shane Dawson, David Dobrik, and Jason Ash. And people have been agreeing with her about how inappropriate some of those people have been treating her when she was still a teenager. However, Tana Mongoose, as we all know, is extremely controversial, scams her fans on the regular, and is problematic on her own. That doesn't mean she isn't right to talk about some of the things in her life where she wasn't in the wrong, but people are thinking that now she's exposing everybody for the fun of it. She also came after a few other TikTokers and Bella Thorne and it's just, it's just confusing. Should we support her or should we not pay attention to her? Tana, sweetie, please stop exposing people for clout. Expose the ones that have to be, okay? Anyways, I don't know. What do you guys think about all the topics that we covered today? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments down below. That was it for today's video, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I post new videos every single week. All right, bye.